Herewith we present an almanac containing a variety of new, useful, and entertaining matter pleasing to men of all humors. Today, our guide is Charles Schwartz, photographer, illustrator, and biologist for the Missouri Conservation Commission. Aren't those fantastic sounds? Did you ever hear anything like that before? Those are voices of vanishing Americans. Those are sounds that you're not apt to hear again, either. Those are the voices of male prairie chickens carrying out their elaborate spring courting display. A hundred years ago, a farmer on one of our prairies could hear these sounds at daybreak all about him. Today, only a handful of very fortunate people can hear that sound. A hundred years ago, that sound was just as commonplace as the everyday noises of automobile traffic is today. About 15 years ago, our Conservation Commission wanted to know why these birds were vanishing, and I was assigned to find out the reason. I started out by contacting farmers and asking them where the birds were. I contacted farmers that lived on the prairie, and I learned a great deal from these people. I learned enough to map the range of the prairie chicken and learn in general something about the birds. But I found that the only way to really know these birds was to get out them and see them very intimately. I learned, for instance, that the prairie chicken was one of our most colorful of all species. It had a very, very uh, elaborate performance in the spring. These gathering places were right out on a ridge top or out on a level stretch of ground. And because of the booming noises the birds made there every spring, these places were called booming grounds. The only way I found these birds was by listening to their calls and by watching my dog. His nose told him where these birds had been. Up until now, I'd been watching the birds from a distance, but I wanted to see them close up, and so I devised a portable blind. My blind consisted of a lightweight metal framework, which could easily be assembled. Then, over this framework, I took and stretched a lightweight cloth stretched it taut enough so that it wouldn't flap in the wind and frighten the birds. I then got in the blind, along with my dog, who didn't mind the long hours of cramped waiting. And after checking the blind and the zippered openings and making sure they gave me a clear view of the booming ground, I left and made camp nearby. Then I returned the next morning before daybreak, got into the blind and quietly waited. First, I could only hear the birds. Then, as the light got a little brighter, I could make out their vague shapes as they scurried about. There seemed to be a great deal of activity going on in this booming ground, but it was still too dim to make out much definitely. Even when I saw one bird and followed him, I couldn't get a great deal out of his performance. Oh, I did watch and noticed that he stamped his feet up and down very rapidly in a dance and that he inflated large, bright orange air sacs on either side of his head. But this creature contrasted a great deal with the prairie chicken that I noticed in a quiet pose. The long neck feathers lay down on either side of this bird's neck, and it didn't dance. This bird was only about two and a quarter pounds, the size of a bantam chicken. But when this bird decided to display, then it was an entirely different creature. He danced, stamping those feet up and down, and inflated those big bright orange air sacs, and gave his three-note booming call. This was a full displaying prairie chicken. And as I watched this bird and the others about him, I suddenly realized that I'd seen this whole performance somewhere before. And it dawned on me, I had seen Plains Indians carrying out some of their tribal dances. And I realized that the feathered ornamentation they had and other accoutrements 
what must have been patterned after these prairie chickens, and even their posturing resembled the dances of these prairie chickens. And it didn't take a lot of imagination to think of a spring morning many years ago and see an Indian lying out here on the prairie watching these birds. There were other things going on on this booming ground besides the booming. Two males would suddenly come together and engage in a bit of a squabble. I marked some of these birds. I trapped them and marked them with bright orange and yellow and blue feathers so that I could distinguish the birds. And I noticed that the same birds seemed to come back to the same places on these booming grounds. Each male had a little territory that he defended from his neighbors. Now these bouts weren't very severe. Sometimes a feather was knocked out, or at most a bird was scratched. But since these chickens had no spurs, they couldn't inflict much damage on one another. Sometimes when I placed my blind in a bird's territory, that bird would get up on top of the blind and attempt to boom there. And then I would place my head against the top of the thin canvas cover. And the bird would jump over on that little protuberance and try to dance there. And if you think that wasn't a sensation, to have a prairie chicken dancing on your head, and it must have been a sensation to the prairie chicken too. These birds boomed a great deal, and all through the spring, as I sat on these blinds, I could hear the birds from other booming grounds. And on some days, I visited these other grounds, and counted the birds, and in that way got an estimate of the number of prairie chickens living in a given region. But all of the birds that I saw on these grounds were males. I didn't see females. Then one day, along about the 1st of April, I noticed that the amount of fighting had diminished a great deal. The birds were still booming and calling, but they didn't seem so interested in these combats that they had been carrying out so vigorously. And on that morning, that particular day, I noticed that the birds suddenly stopped their fighting and squabbling, and one bird walked over to the edge of the booming ground, and then I saw why these territories had been established because a hen came on the ground, and as she walked onto the booming ground, that male and other males rushed over and serenaded her. And this female then walked over into the territory that belonged to one male, and there she accepted that male and mated with him. And so these were places where these chickens could perpetuate their race. There were other things I wanted to know about prairie chickens, why these birds lived where they did, and so I set out to find the answers to those questions too. I wanted to know why they lived on the prairie. Now these chickens seem to be tied up very intimately with the prairie grasses. The prairie grass gave these birds a place to hide in in the winter and seek protection from the drifting snow and ice of the severe storm storms that swept across these prairies. The tall prairie grasses gave the hen prairie chicken a place in which to make her nest and be concealed from the overhead eyes of roving predators. This grassland definitely was the thing that seemed to determine the presence of these prairie chickens. Now, a map of Missouri. When viewed in a very simplified fashion, told far more about the prairie chicken distribution. This region down here was Ozark Plateau country and had very few prairie chickens. This, the southeastern lowlands. We were not concerned with that. But this big area north of the Missouri River with its tall wild blue stem grasses that extended into Iowa and Illinois and Nebraska and down here in the southwestern part of the state where the grasses ranged over into Kansas and even into Oklahoma. This was the land of the prairie chicken. This was the land of the tall blue stem grass. And that grass was so dense that in the early days of settlement, say 130 years ago, a farmer looking for his cattle would have to stand up in the stirrups of his saddle to be able to see his livestock because they were hidden in this tall blue stem grass. Now the history of the birds is one of decline because when man first started to cultivate this land, the birds were influenced in a slight manner, uh, which we might say favorably. They responded to cultivation because the cultivated crops like corn and sorghums actually supported these birds in the winter, whereas formerly 
they had to migrate south in search of food. Now they could stay and spend the winters, and they did prosper. But market hunters, people shooting these birds for the markets in St. Louis and Chicago, soon began to make inroads on the prairie chicken. And then a far more impact than the shooting was the plow, which came in and started to actually overbalance the amount of grassland in favor of cultivation. And so today, the prairie chicken in the northwestern part of the state is a thing of the past because there the lands are so fertile, the soil is so fertile, that there is no place for permanent grass because land is cultivated in a very rapid rotation system. Up in the northeast and north central part of the states, the prairie chickens are dwindling because that land is shrinking. And in the southwest, they are still present on some of the poorer soils that have wild grasses. Now, that's enough for the present of the bird, but what about the future of this species? What can be done? I think, perhaps, that areas might be set aside as reservations, but these areas are costly to maintain and costly to acquire. Small tracts of land, as little as, say, 40 acres, scattered throughout the prairie chicken country, and each having good grass and good food might be the key to prairie chicken survival. I don't know. Perhaps the chicken's actual survival rests with those who till the soil, the farmers. There may be enough who tolerate the prairie chicken and who want it and who would do something about it. I'm not sure. But there again is another point. That's this matter of, well, what do we care if the prairie chicken does pass out of the picture? What have we lost? What do we gain if we have the chicken? Now, from my point of view as a naturalist, I think the prairie chicken has every much a part of our standard of living as our museums do, or as some of the designs on our clothing or our automobiles. After all, those things don't keep us warm or feed us. And I think the prairie chicken is every bit as much a part of our heritage as those things are. And, of course, that's my point of view as a naturalist. Now, frequently we find better answers to these questions when we talk to people who live out on the land, as I did one evening when I talked to a farmer. I asked this old fellow, he lived all his life on the prairies, and I asked him, what do you get out of the prairie chicken? Why do you like to hear it? Why do you like to have it? And he simply said to me, he said, I just kind of like to hear it holler in the spring. Oh, my God.